Hi, today I'd like to talk about Pierre Boulez and his second piano sonata. This is not a particularly easy piece to discuss. Uh, it's certainly a very polarizing piece. Uh, a lot of people absolutely hate this piece, actually. Um, I don't. I think it's actually a very fascinating work. And um, it's often described as uh, extremely difficult, extremely challenging, and, and difficult to get a handle on. <clears throat> but I think that it's, it's quite possible to, uh, to understand uh, this piece and what it's attempting to do, and I think it's even possible to enjoy it quite a lot. Uh, so let's uh, let's just have a little overview of uh, of this work and its background. So um, this is uh, Belez's first major success as a composer. It's his first work that that achieves um, a very high degree of public success and recognition. And in fact, it was premiered on both sides of the Atlantic relatively shortly after its composition and generated an enormous amount of uh, commentary, uh, attention, and certainly controversy. Um, this uh, piece was started in 1946. The, well, the first sketches for the, the third movement date from 1946, though the main part of work on the score was done between 1947 and 1948, so approximately two to three years after the liberation of Paris. So that gives you an idea of the historical context that this work is coming out of. Um, and that's a very, very important thing, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back to that. Um, what's basically happening in this piece is that Boulez is using the tools and the elements of, um, of classical forms against themselves uh, in order to uh, destroy them uh, methodically and deliberately. So this is a very, very different approach from the sort of uh, neoclassicism that was being practiced uh, in Europe between the two wor world wars and for some time afterwards as well. Um, Boulez is using classical forms uh, somewhat sarcastically, and certainly uh, in order to, to destroy them from within. Um, and um, it's music of absolutely remarkable uh, violence and turbulence, and uh, I don't think it's an accident that it was written so shortly after the, after the Second World War. Uh, Boulez understood intuitively um, when he was 22 years old, when he was writing this piece, that, um, that the old world was finished in a sense, that you, you couldn't go back again, you couldn't recapture the, uh, the, the sort of glories of the, the pre-war era, and um, the world was, was forever changed, it was, it, it was not possible to go back, we needed to rethink aesthetics uh, and, and music certainly in, in light of what had happened, in light of the condition of, of mankind, and um, he was very... Uh, adamant and strident about insisting that this had to be done in a radically new way, um, without any concessions to uh, previous aesthetics or previous uh, modes of writing and listening to music. And he felt very strongly that music had to be absolutely of its time, it had to be absolutely modern, so there was, there was just no um, sort of half measures as far as that was concerned. And um, Belez was uh, strongly influenced by um, some some very important figures that at the time were not terribly widely uh, known or appreciated in France. Uh, he was certainly one of the first French composers um, to become interested in the music of the Second Viennese School, Webern, for example, who was almost completely unknown uh, in Paris at the time. His teacher was Olivier Messiaen, um, who uh, taught him some very uh, important things about rhythm that strongly uh, strongly conditioned Boulez's uh, musical thinking uh, in terms of rhythm, and as did Stravinsky. Um, and another important uh, influence on this particular work uh, are the late piano sonatas of Beethoven, particularly the Hammerklavier, um, for its sort of overarching ambition and for its um, um, its grand scale and and the sort of the extreme to which to which it pushes conventional piano technique. Um, there's also a sort of a demonic hyper-expressivity in, 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 in late Beethoven that, that Boulez sort of channels in this work. Um, but he's not coming at this from a purely, only from a purely musical point of view. Boulez was uh, very interested in, in all the other uh, arts, and particularly in literature, and uh, certainly the um, the overall uh, aesthetic, emotional, uh, 
expressive climate of this work owes a lot to uh, sort of um, uh, French uh, uh, late 19th century and early 20th century poetry and uh, also the, the surrealists and the, and the post-surrealists and people like uh, Antonin Artaud and uh, André Breton certainly were, were important uh, in, for, for him in, in um, formulating his aesthetic. Um, he talked about the fact that music must be a form of collective spells and hysteria, so there's a, a very uh, certainly a search for a, an extremely uh, intense and disorienting form of expression. And one thing that is, uh, I would say, characteristic of um, French literature of, of that period and, and of uh, earlier periods as well is you often get a an interesting combination of this this desire for um, for a, a form of disorder, for a form of uh, derangement, uh, a kind of a, a extreme uh, uh, hallucinatory quality, uh, combined with um, a great respect for craft and a great respect for um, for for technical uh, uh, mastery. So that's a very interesting thing when those two qualities coincide, and Willez certainly has that. Um, He's often uh, erroneously described as a, a somewhat uh, cold composer obsessed with technique. Um, well, you could probably argue that he is obsessed with technique, but he he marshals it and harnesses it to very specific ends. Um, and in fact, when you start looking at this piece closely, um, you realize that its technique is actually quite loosely used. It's not a particularly strict or rigorous uh, work. And in fact, when you're listening to it, uh, certainly the, the first impression you get immediately is an impression of disorder and irrationality on a grand scale. Um, now, just in terms of the, the sort of general uh, context of the day, I find it very, very interesting that this work um, was actually completed before the Vier Letzte Lieder, uh, the Four Last Songs of uh, Richard Strauss. Well, that's a very interesting thing because uh, because the, the late Strauss pieces um, are sort of the the epitome of uh, of late romantic uh, music and, and with its the sort of lush harmonies and um, intensely lyrical expression and um, it's a piece that could have been written at the end of the 19th century uh, very plausibly um, so that's a that's a very peculiar thing that that the Willez second piano sonata, which is one of the most revolutionary and, and extreme and disorienting uh, pieces uh, of its time, was actually written after this very sort of backwards-looking piece by by Strauss. So, one thing I think it's important to to bear in mind is that the the avant-garde tends to be focused on issues that are resolutely contemporary, and in, in doing so, they tend to come across as being ahead of their time. They're actually not necessarily ahead of their time. They are expressing their time very precisely. Uh, most people, um, certainly most artists, uh, when they s sit down to create a work of art, they are conditioned not simply by um, the, the, the sort of uh, the, the state of the day, but rather um, the things that they have learned decades ago and the, and the art that they have absorbed that comes from decades and centuries ago. Um, and uh, I'm reminded of a fantastic quote by David Lynch who said that when filmmakers want to make a period movie, they often make the mistake of calling up their set designer and saying, look, this movie is set in 1956, so we need to have all 1956 furniture, it has to be decorated in exactly in 1956 style, and so on. And he says, well, this is actually completely ridiculous because, uh, you know, nobody buys a completely new set of furniture every year. Uh, people just don't do that, you know. People have furniture in their houses that's, that's 10, 20, 30 years old. So if you want to do a, an authentic 1956 period movie, you're going to have to get furniture from the 20s and 30s. And uh, so that's a kind of an interesting thing. You can get extremely different, uh, divergent um, aesthetics uh, and uh, philosophies and worldviews uh, coexisting, uh, and it's just the reason I'm bringing this up is simply to point out that that uh, musical history does not proceed along a sort of single line, uh, inexorably towards the future. There's a constant um, push and pull between uh, between the past, the music, the historical music of the past, and and the concerns of the day. And what Blaise did that I think really sets him apart from his contemporaries.
um, and in, indeed from uh, from older composers like Strauss, is he was very concerned with being absolutely modern, and again with uh, with not um, relying on the crutch of the past in his work. So that's certainly um, that's certainly a, a disorienting and difficult, and it can be a problematic thing for a lot of audiences. Um, so let's uh, let's start looking at this piece. So I mentioned that the the, the deuxième sonate uses um, sort of classical techniques and a classical overall construction and form. Um, so it's it's laid out in a sort of classical form movement uh, format. Uh, much like any sort of uh, classical piano sonata would have been. So the first movement is a is basically a sonata allegro form. Uh, a sonata allegro uh, in which the themes are replaced by texture types, and I'll explain that a little bit later. Uh, the second movement is uh, a slow movement, essentially, uh, in more or less uh, an arch, uh, sort of ABA type of shape, which consists of a, a so-called theme and a variation. The third movement is a scherzo with trios, and the fourth movement is rather formally complex. It contains numerous episodes, including uh, a fugue, and the fugue also is a, a sort of a reference, if you like, to, to late Beethoven, in that the, the, the fugue starts in the absolute lowest register of the piano, and uh, it basically decimates the fugue form in, in a similar way to what uh, Beethoven did in his uh, Grosse Fugue. The overall work lasts about 30 minutes, so it's it's very it's very long. It's not an easy piece necessarily to sit through from beginning to end, um, and it it sort of occupies a consistently extreme register throughout in terms of expression, in terms of complexity, in terms of uh, in terms of its ambition certainly, and it doesn't really let up. Even in the slow movement, it it doesn't really let up. So that can be a challenge to uh, for for listeners for sure. Um, now, uh, if you've heard of or about the Second Viennese schools, uh, Second Viennese school composers, so Schoenberg, Berg, and Webern, uh, you've probably heard about uh, about you know, dodecaphonic or twelve-tone composition, which was a technique that was used by these composers. And what uh, Boulez and and his uh, his colleagues and contemporaries, some of them, were doing was uh, elaborating. Uh, a new system of uh, musical composition, uh, which is not the same thing as as twelve tone composition, and it can be loosely described as serial composition. And one of the main attributes of serial composition um, is that the different parameters of music, so pitch and rhythm, for example, uh, or tone color, or um, or uh, dynamics or articulation, are dissociated from each other, and they can be varied. Uh, and developed independently. So, um, so that's kind of a that's a very interesting thing, and it, it results in sometimes extremely complex music. Um, and part of the reason that this happens um, in in this particular piece is that Boulez was convinced that um, if you're going to completely redefine the way that you organize pitches and the way that you you conceive of uh, melodies and harmonies and so on then you have to do that on every level. You can't just do it on the level of pitch. You have to also do it on, on the rhythmic level. So he could understand, for example, why in, in late Schoenberg you would have, um, you would have very complex harmonies uh, that are coming out of this 12-tone style, but then an extremely conventional form of rhythmic writing. Um, and as far as he was concerned, those, that level of complexity that you would get in the, on the level of pitch had to be manifest in a similar way in the other parameters as well. Um, so this piece does actually have a 12-tone series, sort of, at least it's heard at the outset, it's heard in the, in the first couple of bars of this movement, and it's heard another, uh, in, in the third movement as well, uh, and it's heard in different forms in the other movements. Um, but the 12-tone the, the series that you hear at the beginning certainly does not govern the entire piece. Um, and it's probably better to think of it as a reservoir uh, from which different cells, little short motifs and little short uh, groups of pitches are extracted. So generally three groups of three, four, 
or five pitches. And then these become sort of autonomous independent entities that develop uh, basically independently. So there's no attempt to present the 12 tone row as a, as a whole thing and to sort of permutate it and have it backwards and upside down and so on. He's taking actually much smaller elements out of it and then using these in a very free way. So for example, um, if we look at this little a diagram at the bottom of the screen here of the of the twelve tone row that you hear at the beginning, the last three pitches uh, forms a, a unit that he's that he's pulled out of this group of, of notes, and uh, he doesn't necessarily present it in that order. You can present it as a chord. You can have it backwards. You can change the order of the notes around. It's sort of like a, a reservoir that you can you can basically use in a in a very free way. So. I'd like to look at specifically um, how the first movement works, and I mentioned earlier that it is essentially a sonata allegro form, and that it sort of very sarcastically uh, makes reference to this uh, this form, uh, because obviously Boulez is 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 aiming for something radically new. So the idea of writing a sonata uh, could only uh, could only be somewhat um, uh, somewhat ironic in, in the context of this piece. So, um, generally speaking, in a, in, a, in a sonata form, you have either contrasting themes or at least contrasting uh, tonal regions, and you have a sort of a dialogue or a, a dialectic between these two different entities. Uh, in this piece, there are no themes. However, you do have an opposition of two distinct texture types. And these texture types basically replace the themes. So. On the one hand, you have um, contrapuntal, essentially contrapuntal passages, which consist of very short um, cells and rhythmic figures, uh, which are constantly changing and developing and being varied all the time. Um, and then you have a second type of material that is basically harmonic. So uh, you have uh, basically a very strict three-part writing, so three voices, and they uh, they have. All, all three voices will be in the same rhythm, so it'll sound like basically a chorale. So you have an opposition between contrapuntal writing and, and essentially harmonic writing, on the other hand. And uh, each of these two texture types has its own associated tempo. So for example, texture type 1 is associated with the tempo of quarter note equals 132, and the second one is associated with the tempo of half note equals 84. So just to um, go over some of the general features of this initial texture type, the, the sort of contrapuntal material in this piece, um, Boulez kicks things off with um, music that, as I mentioned earlier, gives an uh, instantaneous effect of disorientation. It is extremely fast, it is extremely complex. Uh, there's all these different small figures that uh, that follow each other very, very rapidly. You don't have time to catch your bearings, you don't have time really to um, to integrate or, or remember the identity of the material that just comes so quickly. Um, and the overall impression, again, is, is one of extreme violence and, and disorder, certainly. Um, the piano writing is characterized by extremely large intervals throughout, so the, it, it's actually very, very difficult to play this music because the the, the, the stretches and the, the sort of leaps between from, between note and note are, are so great all the time. The pianist has to leap over the entire register of the instrument uh, more or less constantly. There's, there's There are very few uh, moments in the piece where Boulez concentrates on a single uh, narrowly defined uh, register and stays there. He, it really does move around a lot, uh, very, very quickly. Um, it is music in which uh, uh, counterpoint is is a defining characteristic, and the voices, uh, as Boulez makes very clear in his uh, in his preface to the score, are all absolutely equal. So there is no foreground or background distinction. All of the voices, all of the counterpoints are of equal importance. Um, and that is also a very remarkable thing for a French composer to have asserted uh, in the 1940s. Um, now, if you look at the, the phrases in the sort of opening part of the piece, you know, also notice one other thing, which is that most of them are, are strikingly directional. In other words, they tend to either go down or go up. So when, when you have a phrase that is sort of inclining 
downwards, that is sort of uh, falling, uh, you can call that a catabasis. And when you have a phrase that is rising, you would call it an anabasis. So these are the two basic types of movement that you get in these phrases. But again, they're very short and they follow each other very quickly. So uh, you have to be alert and uh, it takes quite a few listenings to get your bearings in this piece. So uh, let's just listen to the opening nine bars and that'll give you a sense of what kind of, what kind of world this is. Right, so that goes by at incredible speed, and um, it might be interesting just to just to pull this apart for a second and see how this is actually made and, and what the different elements are. So, just in the first two bars, so this is maybe one second, just slightly more than one second of music. Um, we have we have three different figures that 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 come by at amazing speed. So the first figure uh, consists of the first four notes of this 12-tone series. Actually, the, the first two bars uh, themselves, if you just isolate them, constitute a, a statement of the 12 chromatic tones. So it's it's a statement of a 12-tone row. And the so the, the first four notes, which I've got here highlighted in yellow and labeled A, are the first four tones of this row. And what you see right away is that they consist of two uh, consonant intervals, so a major fifth, a rising major fifth, followed by a rising major fourth. The, the major fifth sort of shrinks down into a uh, major fourth. Um, so let's just hear that. Right, and then the second little unit here, which I've got in red and labeled B, consists of three different pitches of which the first is repeated and um, this is a rhythmic figure that recurs throughout the entire movement many, many, many times in different forms. So let's just listen to that. Right, so these are, as you can hear, extremely tiny little units. And then uh, after that we have a, an, another figure which consists of a two-note chord played in the left hand and a rising triplet figure in the right hand, so that sounds like this. All right, so let's just hear those one more time. And these contrabundal sections are, are just built up of hundreds of these little phrases and, and little uh, uh, cells that are, again, constantly varied. And the other interesting thing about that is that these are not these are, this is not motivic writing in the sense that the, the Second Viennese School often did, or certainly uh, their sort of antecedents, the composers like Brahms and, and Schumann, uh, in the sense that you don't have um, melodic units um, that are associated with specific uh, rhythmic units. It doesn't really work that way. As I mentioned earlier, this is a, this is a serial piece, and these, these different elements actually vary independently from each other. So the, uh, the rhythmic figure that I've got labeled B there, and when that reappears, it won't necessarily reappear with the same configuration of pitches, um, and and the same holds true of the of the of the of the pitches, the little pitch groups. They don't necessarily always come back with the same rhythm. So, I want to just uh, before we move on, just play the beginning of the of the piece again. Now that we've heard those little cells. Again, it can take quite a few hearings before you start to get your bearing in this music, but I can promise you it's worth it. It's worth the effort. Uh, there's one other um, element, one other little cell that I'd, I'd like to mention before moving on, which is uh, in bar five, you see a, a trill figure preceded by two grace notes. Um, and that sort of recurs throughout the movement uh, as a kind of, a kind of uh, tick in a way. And uh, what's actually interesting, if you, if you look at the, the notes that appear in these figures, uh, well, in this specific one, we have uh, B natural, A natural, B flat, and C natural, and that is nothing other than the initials of Bach. 
B A C H. So in, in German music notation, that would be spelled B flat A C B natural. And uh, that is an allusion to, to Bach and certainly to his contrapuntal mastery, but is also an allusion to the Second Viennese School. And those composers also um, made reference to uh, the initials of Bach in their compositions. So that's a kind of a remarkable thing. And you'll notice also that. Uh, that Boulez makes quite a few references to Germanic culture in this piece uh, in 1947-1948, shortly after the liberation of Paris, and he's a French composer, so that's also, I think, a very remarkable thing. So, moving on. Let's have a look now at the second texture type. So, um, I mentioned earlier that the, the second texture type is basically uh, homorhythmic. It basically consists of, uh, in other words, of, of lines that all uh, follow the same rhythm. Um, and in keeping with the earlier material, this material is extremely uh, wide-ranging, with very, very, very wide uh, intervallic leaps, often more than an octave, so the, the voices are just going all over the place. They cross each other, uh, so it's actually very difficult to have a uh, perception of, of the counterpoint and of the, the individual lines within these harmonies uh, because they're constantly crossing. So um, it's a huge challenge to the, to the pianist, certainly, to, to bring that across. Uh, the recording we heard earlier, incidentally, was by Maurizio Pollini, and it is, in my view, one of the great, great uh, contemporary music recordings of the 20th century. Uh, it is an, an amazing recording of this piece. There are many remarkable recordings of, of this piece, but that that one really just nails it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and one of the results of this extremely wide chord spacing is that sometimes the chords that appear in this second material are actually unplayable um, as they're written. So for example, if you look at the very last chord of this, uh, of this excerpt, so right here, uh, well, that's an enormous stretch. Uh, it's not actually physically possible to play, so what usually happens is pianists play one of the notes as an appoggiatura very quickly, and then they immediately attack the rest of the notes as, as quickly as they can. I guess you could also, if you wanted to be really creative about it, you could simply overdub them uh, when you were making a recording, but obviously that's something that is impossible to do in a concert. So let's just uh, have a listen to this to hear how it contrasts with the first material. Right, so it contrasts with the first material, but there, there isn't exactly a let-up in tension. I mean, this is still very complex, uh, uh, dissonant, and, uh, and, and difficult music in, in a lot of respects. Um, but again, that's part of the point. He, this, is, this music is intended to be hysterical, delirious, and, and sort of completely wild. And uh, that is really the expressive world that Boulez is coming out of. This is a, a young man with uh, incredible ambition and who wants to sort of, um, in a way, make a point. This is almost sort of polemical music in a sense. He's, he's deliberately exaggerating his, his technique and deliberately exaggerating his expression in order to, to bring it across as forcefully and as, uh, and as massively as possible. So uh, this is a, a piece that announces the outsized ambition of a very young composer. Um, now, the, the sonata certainly uh, poses some interesting issues of perception, um, one of which is that the underlying construction of the work is basically hidden or inaudible, and in fact it's, it's a very difficult piece to analyze, uh, even if you sort of know how it's constructed. It's, it takes a lot of patient work to try to determine uh, what the um, individual components are and, and how they're developed and, and so on. So, And a few analyses have actually been, been published of the work, and what's interesting is that they often uh, contradict each other. Um, so uh, it's, it is a very complex work, and I think that um, uh, it, it could take some time before uh, we have sort of a, an exhaustive uh, uh, analysis of the whole thing. Not that you necessarily need to do that to appreciate it aesthetically and to appreciate what the composer is trying to do. Um, anyway, the, the, the counterpoint, I mentioned this earlier um, when I was talking about the second texture type, is, is 
very often not perceptible as such, and the extract that you see now on the screen from the third movement is uh, an excellent illustration of that. Uh, when, you look at, uh, when you look at this on the screen, you see uh, beams connecting notes that are extremely disjunctive, so with enormous leaps, uh, one more than an octave, sometimes more than two octaves between, between uh, notes in the same, what appears to be the same voice. And so uh, when you look at this sort of forest of, uh, of beams uh, going all over the place and crisscrossing in every direction, um, on the page it certainly implies that these are voices and that they have a certain cohesive identity as voices. But when you hear this music played, uh, that is completely imperceptible. You don't hear the, the, the beaming, obviously. You just hear pitches in extremely uh, widely spaced uh, intervals across the entire keyboard. So uh, the, the perception of, of voice in writing like this is, uh, is extremely problematic, to say the least. Um, that's not necessarily the point of, of why he was writing this way, but it certainly presents a, an enormous challenge to the pianist if you want to try to at least try to make that somewhat audible. Um, and the other thing is in this music Boulez's is a, a sort of harmonic and, and a sort of melodic uh, technique, his, his, his pitch writing if you like, uh, is in a certain sense uh, in a very early stage of its development. It's not particularly sophisticated and he's not particularly concerned with harmony. In fact, the, this work overall has a very gray kind of uh, quality in terms of the harmony. It's, it contains so many different intervals and so many uh, rapidly changing different combinations of, of notes and harmonies. Um, it has such an incredibly rapid uh, harmonic rhythm um, that uh, you're not going to hear this work harmonically, uh, at least not primarily. Um, you're going to hear it primarily as uh, as texture and certainly as rhythm, and again, rhythm is uh, an extremely important aspect of this piece. It's not to say that the pitches are completely irrelevant and they, they could have been written randomly, that's not true at all, but it's just that they, they take a back seat, I would say, to other uh, parameters. Um, so uh, when you listen to a piece like this, uh, it's important to, I think, listen to it for what it is and not for what it is not. So you're not going to get um, a sort of uh, um, a richly uh, varied uh, sort of uh, harmonic language. Um, not really. His, his pitch technique here is, again, fairly uh, at, at a fairly early stage of its, of its development. It became much, much more sophisticated in, in later works, certainly in Le Marteau Saint Maître, uh, not to speak of uh, later works such as uh, Répon or uh, Sur Incise, uh, in which there is much, much more of an audible uh, harmonic uh, language that has a, a high degree of consistency to it. Um, so again, the main point with this piece uh, is its intensely disorienting, uh, complex, uh, and sort of a, a hyper expressive kind of atmosphere and I, that is the way I think that it is intended to be listened to. It is, it is meant to to shock and, and, and sort of derange and, uh, and uh, sort of present a radically new uh, vision of music for the 20th century.